We're so glad that you're here today, and uh, today, as I've already stated, I want to talk to you about our kids, our children. And the title of my message today is Raising Healthy Kids. And by this, I don't mean just what they eat. I'm talking about raising spiritually healthy kids. Now, I want you to think about this. You are just the parent God had in mind for your kids. Now, think about that. That should be something that encourages you. Uh, You are not random. God had you in mind when he gave you children. The Bible is very clear that children are a gift from the Lord, okay? God is the one that gives children. So he chose you. So not only did he choose you to be their parent, he chose them to be your kid. That that puts a different light on things, doesn't it? It's not some random act. It's not some accidental thing. Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord. Now, with a gift comes a responsibility. Let let, let me me tell you what I mean by that. Salvation is a gift from God. We know that it is. According to the Bible, salvation is a gift from God. Now, you can do one of two things with salvation. You can either receive it or you can reject it. Some people reject, but God wants you to receive it. So with a gift comes salvation. A responsibility with salvation you can either receive it or reject it but I think the responsibility that comes with a gift uh, is a couple things one you need to be thankful to the giver uh, you need to enjoy the gift and you should make the most of the gift right be thankful to the giver enjoy the gift I mean that's the reason it was given um, and uh, make the most of it. Let me just give you a simple illustration that I think demonstrates what we're to do with this. Uh, a couple years ago, three, or f- three years ago maybe, um, at Christmas time, we went to a Christmas party. You ever been to a Christmas party? How many like Christmas? Let's hear it. You like Christmas? All right. Some of you don't like Christmas because uh, <laughs> you just didn't demonstrate it, okay? So, uh, or maybe, maybe you just are still paying off Christmas from three years ago, and you're just uh, s- stressed by it. Okay, I get it. But uh, we went to the, one of these Christmas parties where you drew gifts or drew names. You, you know what I'm talking about when I say that? We uh, put everybody's name at the party in a little basket, a bowl, and everybody drew out one name. And whoever's name you got that's who you would buy a gift for. Now, they did not know that you got their name, and uh, nobody, uh, you didn't know who got your name, but you would draw names. And that saved us from having to buy hundreds of dollars worth of gifts for everybody at the, at the, the party. You would get one person a gift because you drew names. Um, now, what we did in this gift is we, in, in this party, we limited it to between 10 and $15. Okay, so let's be honest. You probably are not going to have your life forever changed by a gift that costs ten to fifteen dollars. Especially now, you can't even really get a happy meal for that. All right, but this was a few years ago, and so um, there was a member of our staff at the time that drew my name, and so we came to the party, and it was uh, exciting. We were having a good time, and. I received my gift, and just so you know, uh, Patrick Chapman was the one that drew my name. He was on our staff at the time, and uh, Patrick is a young man that got saved and baptized in our church, called into ministry in our church, and is serving the Lord, and and we love him dearly, Uh, and he's always just been very special uh, to our church, but he is the one that drew my name. Now, I was like, you know, what can you get that's going to be memorable, useful for 10 to 15 bucks? And, and during the party, it came my time to open the gift. And I should have brought it to show it to you, but I got a coffee cup, okay, that was a North Carolina Tar Heels coffee cup, all right? Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm a big North Carolina Tar Heels fan. I grew up there. 
I, I started playing basketball when I was young. Love basketball, love the Tar Heels. So I've been a big North Carolina Tar Heel fan ever since. And so he got me this coffee cup, and it said, it has the emblem, the logo of the North Carolina Tar Heels. Now, every morning that I've been at home, there's been some times I've been away from home, but every morning since that time, without fail, I have used that coffee cup. Now, I let Patrick know that I was very, very thankful for this. Now, once again, it didn't break anybody's bank. It didn't change my life. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, somebody gave me a brand new car or gave me a winning lottery ticket, okay? It was a, it's a coffee cup. But you know what I learned from that was I was thankful to the giver, and um, I used the gift, and I've made the most of it. I could honestly say of probably most of the gifts that I've gotten in my life, I've probably used that more than almost any other gift I've received. It's very simple. It's not life-changing. I appreciate it, and it's something that I've really, really enjoyed. Now, when it comes to our children, you and I need to do the exact same thing. First of all, we need to be thankful to the giver. And make no mistake about it, God is the giver of your children. Look, you may not have planned on having your kid, but God did. You know, Kim and I, we have three children. Our youngest daughter, her name is Brooke. She'll be 29 years old on Monday. We're actually, this afternoon, we're having a party, and I'm grilling out some steaks and stuff for her birthday, okay? Now, when Brittany and Brandon, our two oldest children, were born, we were good. We were like, you know what? Uh, we've got a boy, we've got a girl, and they're, really, they're only 17 months apart. It's almost like having twins, we can get them out of our house roughly at the same time, all right? So, um, but of course, even though we were not necessarily planning to have another child, God planned on us having another child. And Brooke has been just a tremendous joy to our life. So here's what I want you to understand. You may not have been planning your kids. You may not have planned on having your kid, but God did. God, in fact, God chose you, and that's good news. So what we've got to do is we've got to be thankful to the giver, who's God. We've got to make sure that we enjoy his gift, and let's be honest, there are sometimes you enjoy your kids more than others, all right? And <laughs> I didn't I mean for you to say amen at that, but nevertheless, <laughs> that's okay, all right? So... Uh, look, we all have good days and bad days. You remember that, and I hate to say this, this is a beer commercial from years ago. Uh, it said, some days are better than others. You remember that? Okay. And that's the way it is with kids, that some days are just better than others. All right. Some days are more enjoyable than others. But here's the point. You are to be thankful to the giver, and you are to enjoy the gift. And then we're to make the most of it. Just in the same way that a simple coffee cup, I was thankful to the giver, I've enjoyed that gift immensely, and I've made the most of it, okay? In the same way, God wants you and me to understand that children are his gift to us. And if you have children, if you have grandchildren, we are to be thankful to God. We are to enjoy them. My mom and dad let me know. Uh, Brittany, our oldest, is, uh, she was the first grandchild on both sides. So my, my mom and dad, it was their first grandchild, and uh, Kim's mom and dad, that was their first grandchild. Brittany was the first on both sides. And they let us know quite clearly and quickly that they liked the grandkids more than they liked us, all right? And, and that's understandable, okay? My mom told me one time, she said, I like the grandkids twice as much. I said, oh, really? Why is that? She said, they make me happy when they come, and they make me happy when they leave, all right? <laughs> but what you and I must learn to do is 
to make the most of this relationship that God has given us. And even if you don't have children of your own, listen closely. This message is for you. Why? Because God wants you to influence others. Um, So even if you have young children or teenage children or grandchildren or no children, this message is for you. Our text today is one verse, Proverbs 22, verse 6, a very famous verse of Scripture. Here's what it says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a little controversy over this verse. Some people think it means something different than other people think that it means. Some people think that this verse means that if you're the right parent, your kids are never going to stray. They're, ne- they're always going to go to church, and they're always going to love the Lord, and they're always going to make the right choice. Well, that's really not realistic because God's first two kids, Adam and Eve, they sinned, all right? So the, the point is this, that uh, you're, you're not going to have perfect kids. You're not a perfect parent. Uh, then there are others that believe, and I believe this is probably more accurate, uh, that when it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. doesn't mean when he's an old man or an old woman, uh, but rather when they get older, that the training is not going to leave them. doesn't mean they're always going to listen to it. doesn't mean that you're always going to agree with every decision they make as they get older. But what it means is, that there's always a foundation there. And I've seen this in so many people's lives. In fact, over the years, there have been many people that joined our church. They went to church as a kid. Their parents were Christians. And then when they became college age or a little older maybe, what happened? They dropped out of church. Happens time and time and time again. And yet you see that often as they get older, they will end up coming back. Now, that is not a guarantee. Are there some children that are raised in church that their parents have been good parents, that uh, they dropped out of church and they never really started serving God again? Yes. Okay. So the promise is not that if you hold your mouth just right and you quote the verses just right, that your kids are always going to be perfect. They are always going to do the right thing. Well, we know that simply isn't true, okay? Because we have a free will. And your children, when they get older, they have the opportunity to make their own choices, okay? So let's look at it again. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The word train up, it gives the idea of dedicating your child. I'm to dedicate my child to the way he should go. Now, some people believe that this means that um, every child is an individual and you got to tailor exactly how they're to live or what they believe to that child. I actually don't believe that's what it means. I don't believe that it's a bad application to say kids are different, uh, each kid needs some basic Uh, approach that's a little different than the others. I do agree with that. But I do not believe that everything in that child's life has to be tailored specifically just for their whims or just for their ego or just for their personality, okay? Now, of course, wisdom tells us that you've got to learn to discipline your child in a way that is appropriate for them, okay? We have three kids. Uh, Each of our kids was different. Each of our kids received discipline in a different way. Um, there, and I'm not going to call out individual ones, but uh, because I'm going to see them this afternoon. All right. So, um, but uh, we had uh, a child that was very meek and eager to please, and you basically had to just tell her, and she'd do it. We very rarely ever disciplined her. For far as spankings go, okay? Um, we have another child that um, the ta- he would wear the Tasman... I said he. Um, <laughs> he would have worn out the Tasmanian devil, okay? So 
uh, the Tasmanian devil would have been like, dude, slow down, uh, you know, give me a break, I didn't catch my breath. Um, but every child is different. So yes, there is wisdom and understanding that each child is different. But the understanding here is this. We're to dedicate our child to God and to the right path. That's what it means. To train up your child is to dedicate them to God and to dedicate them to the right path. Now, let me tell you how you do this. And this is beautiful in how to deal with your parents, your kids, and your grandkids. And I said parents, yes, because your parents sometimes need to see in you the things they invested in you. But this idea, uh, to the ancient Hebrews, they use this word, the, the idea of training up. I realize that's two English words, but it comes from one Hebrew word. And so the ancient Hebrews use this word to describe, now get this, this is interesting, what a young mother would do to create hunger in her baby. And what they would do, and I know some of you think this sounds gross, but in the day, uh, that mother would take dates. You ever had dates? I love dates. They're so good. They taste so good. They're so sweet. But that young mother would take dates and chew them in her mouth so that, you know, obviously you can't make a baby eat solid food when they're first born. But what she would do is she would create this little paste, if you will, and she would take her finger and she would rub the sweet dates on her baby's gums. And he said, why did they do that? Well, the intention was to create a suckling motion in this baby and to create an appetite. Now, most babies don't have a problem with appetite, but every one of you mothers know this, that you've got to make sure that that baby knows how to nurse, that that baby knows how to feed, because some babies uh, find it more difficult than others, okay? And so the point is that God is showing parents that they have a responsibility to create a hunger for God in their children. This is what this means. So what am I to do if I'm going to create a hunger for God in my children well, I've got to learn that uh, there's some concepts here about discipline that we've got to learn to discipline our children. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I've got to create a desire for God in my children. Now, the interesting thing is this, that, um, that like the old saying, the old proverb, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And this is true, okay? Uh, you cannot have a substitute relationship with God for your kids. I want you to understand this, okay? In other words, you can have your kids in church every Sunday, love the Lord, pray, read the Bible, be consistent, be faithful, and that does not guarantee that your child is going to serve God with their life. It just doesn't, okay? Now, what will it do if you are transparent and you help this kid to see your relationship with God? It will create a desire for them. You can't make them, but you can create a desire in them. And so uh, this idea that some people are like, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to force it down my kids' throats and I'm going to let them make their own choices about Religion and God and their relationship with God. Well, don't be that dumb, okay? Because and I, I realize I shouldn't say that, okay? Because I'm in church and I'm a pastor. But let me, let me rephrase it. Don't be that stupid, okay? Because you don't do that with anything else. Well, you know, my, my kid's six years old. Now I'm going to let him make his own decision about his education. Well, you wouldn't do that. You know why? Because he wouldn't go, Okay? Uh, well, you know what? We live next to the highway, and my kid's got to learn on his own not to wander. I mean, after all, I'm not going to be there all the time, so he makes his own choice about whether he's going to play in the street or not. Are you out of your mind? Okay? You don't do this in any other way. Once again, you can't legislate a relationship with God with your kids. You can't force them to have a relationship with God. They've got to have a relationship with God themselves 
but you can create that desire. You can help hone that relationship with God in, in their life. Now, there are a, a few principles that I want to give you that we see here, um, and, and here they are. You got to learn to build on fundamental principles that persevere. Train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. The, the point being, there are some fundamental pr principles that are going to pass the test of time. And having them in a relationship with God is one of those principles, okay? Now, you may hear of the latest fad. You may hear of the latest craze in parenting. And, and my goodness, there are some absolutely crazy things isn't it funny how that there have been billions and billions of babies born throughout human history, and yet your first time is like the most important one in the world, right? Okay? And that's because it's yours, okay? That's because that child is God's gift to you, all right? So it's very important. Um, but often we will hear some of the craziest ideas about raising children. We're in the middle of a cultural shift. I don't know how long it'll last, but that people have lost their ever love in mind about what to do with their kids. And I'm not going to get political here, but let me tell you something. Genesis chapter 1, God created them male and female. Hello, can I get an amen right there, okay? Amen. Now, are we to be loving toward people that disagree with us? Yes. Okay, we are. We're to share the love of God with everyone. But if you think that, um, you know, a biological male should uh, play on the girls' soccer team, I'm sorry, you are wrong. All right? So he said, well, you don't normally get that pointed about it. Well, the fact is, we've got to use principles that persevere based on the Word of God, not on our political agenda, not on what the culture says around us, okay? Number two, you got to start when they're young. Raise up a child in the way you should go. And, and here's the point. Uh, don't wait too late. Start young. It's important. Number three, you've got to use concepts that a child understands. Do you know that's why we have children's ministry here at this church. Right now, while we're in this service, my wife and some wonderful leaders and volunteers are downstairs, and they are running our children's ministry, birth through, uh, you know, fifth grade, all right? Now, why? Because we want kids to have concepts that they understand. It's not that they can't understand me, but the fact is, we want them to learn about God in a way that applies to them, all right? So it's very important. And then number four, and this is very important, you got to learn to trust God for the results. you got to learn to trust God for the results. Can I be real blunt with you about this? We often as parents get disappointed, okay? Because they didn't do what we thought they should do. Or they didn't make the choice that we thought they should make. And I, and I must say that, um, you know, you got to trust God with the results, okay? Because God loves them more than you do. So here's, here's what I want to give you. I want to give you three thoughts and we're done. Uh, about the purpose of discipline. We're talking about raising healthy kids. You've got to learn to discipline your children for God's glory and for their benefit. Let me say that again. You've got to discipline your children for God's glory and their benefit. Let me, let me show you this from Scripture. Uh, let's talk about the purpose of discipline. The word discipline, do you know what the root word for discipline is? It's disciple. And so when I discipline my children, I am making a disciple out of them. Okay? Now, the word discipline has probably been corrupted over the years. For some in the room, you think discipline just means to beat the hell out of them, okay? Um, now, the Bible does tell us don't 
be afraid to spank your kid, okay? You're not going to kill them, all right? Now, does God support abuse? Absolutely not, okay? But the truth is, the purpose of discipline is to make a disciple. That's really the purpose of it. And then it benefits your child when you train them. In fact, the word discipline, it means to train. It means to instruct. Now, without using metaphors that would be undignified, um, we are pretty good at training when it comes to our pets or our animals. And yet, often when it comes to our children, we let those principles go out the window. Now, what do I mean by this? There's a purpose for discipline. It's not to harm your kid. It's to help your kid. It's not to make their life worse, maybe for a moment, so that they get the understanding that, like my dad used to say, uh, he used to say, I applied the board of education to the seat of knowledge, and it brought forth understanding. <laughs> and it did. It really, really did. So uh, what is the purpose of discipline? It's to benefit your kids and make them better. And then, actually, it's to prove you love them. You say, oh, no. That, that, oh, let me read to you from Scripture. Uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you for the Lord corrects those he loves. Now, can we all be honest? We've all been to the store and some beautiful little blessing from God, we'll say it that way, is absolutely terrorizing his mother or her mother, and causing a scene so that everybody in the store is uncomfortable. And you know as well as I know that you have thought in your mind, lady, if you will let me take that child for about an hour, he will stop doing that, okay? You've thought it. Don't, don't lie to me. You're in church, okay? You know exactly what I'm saying. But you know why we don't do that? It's because that's not our kid, okay? And, you know, the truth is, in the culture I grew up in, not only did my parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or whoever felt like it, uh, could they discipline me, but my neighbors, I mean, I'm, oh my goodness, I got spankings from my neighbors before. Anybody else, their parents love them? All right, so, okay, yeah. Uh, anybody else, their neighbors take out their frustration on you? All right, so, look. I, I was there, okay? But here's the point. Discipline proves that you love that child, that that child is yours, okay? It, it's, not, it's not harmful. In fact, it is completely harmful not to discipline the child. Number two, we've seen the purpose of discipline. Now I want to show you the power of discipline. What does it do? Uh, Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. Now, I realize that sometimes it goes against our very emotions. You don't want to discipline. You don't want to correct that child. You love that child so much, it harms your heart. And I used to think that my mom and my dad, when they told me, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I always thought, give me that belt and I'll show you who it hurts. I... <laughs> but I understand. I understand. And so do you. Here's the point. There is power in discipline. It says, discipline your children while there is hope. There comes a point when it's too late. That's what he's saying. You got to do it now. So what does discipline do? Um, it gives hope. Romans 8, 1. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Do you get the idea that the sinful nature of our children, and every one of them is born with a sinful nature, that unchecked, unchanged, it leads to death. And I'm not talking about physical death, though it certainly can do that as well. 
but it leads to eternal spiritual death. So you discipline your, your kid while there's hope. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Don't fail to discipline your children. And we're going to use a Bible word here, okay? You may not know what it means. I'll explain it. The rod of punishment won't kill them. You said, does that mean I'm supposed to get a big old two by four and hit my kids upside the head? But no, that's not what he's talking about. This is a metaphor, okay? Uh, though my parents believed in the literal interpretation of that. Uh, it says, the rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. You say, oh my, what does that mean? Well, the idea here is not that um, only that discipline is important to their safety. And by the way, it is. When I was little, uh, we were out riding bicycles one time uh, with my family, my mom, my dad, my sister, and me, and we were out in the country, and uh, my dad kept yelling at me. And I was like, what is he yelling about? And I'm looking back. And he suddenly starts giving it everything he's got, yelling at me, and I thought he was going to race. And so I was like, oh, yeah. And I turned around, and I was headed right toward a car that was coming. I was all the way over in the other lane. Now, my dad, he, he got a little bit anxious. He got a little bit extreme, but he was doing it for my health, for my safety. And that's the point. Uh, the idea that it could save them from death is talking about their relationship with God. Um, it helps prepare them for that. It could save them, and here's the Hebrew word, sheol, sheol. Uh, and that word means the grave, the place of the dead, hell, okay? Um, 31 times it's translated as the grave, death, or the place of the dead. 31 times it's translated as hell. And it means the place of no return. So God's saying here that if you don't discipline your kid, you are taking a chance that you're not going to save their soul from hell. That word means the place of no return, the place of no praise of God, the place of punishment, and the place where the wicked are sent, and the place where the righteous are not sent. So I've got biblical reason to say what I say from time to time, you need to beat the hell out of them, all right? Not, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but the truth of the matter is this. Without discipline, you're endangering their eternal soul. And that's his point. Discipline gives life. Well, let me give you the last point. We've talked about the purpose of discipline, the power of discipline. Let's talk about the practice of discipline. Now, I don't have much time left, but I, I do want to give you some thoughts here that I think will help you, especially if you have young children. Psalm 127 tells us that parents are like warriors and children are like arrows. Parents, you must have a warrior mentality. If you don't think that we're in a war, you haven't been paying attention. We're in a war all around us. You've got to have a warrior to warrior mentality. And guess what warriors do? They've got to develop skill. They got to have strength. And most importantly, they got to get the arrow to the target. That's their job. And so God tells us as parents in the practice of discipline, how do we do this? The main thing, the main thing is to get your little arrows to the right target. Now we aim our kids at targets all the time. We want them to have a good education. Nothing wrong with that. That's an important thing. We want them to have a good career. Nothing wrong with that. That's an important thing. But maybe we think, well, maybe my kid, uh, maybe all this traveling to baseball games will pay off and he'll play for the Atlanta Braves one day. Eh, I hope, hope so. And I hope he's a member of this church and tithes. All right, so that's all I'm saying. 
But I'm not depending on that. Here's my point. You and I must understand that we've got to develop skill and get our kids to the target. What is the target? Target is Jesus. Target is a relationship with God. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. From him. This shows that they've got a sin nature. And they need a savior. So, if I'm going to be a warrior and get my kid to the target, you know what? Let me tell you what the number one thing. You say, well, you got to teach them respect. Yes, that's important, but that's not the number one thing. Well, you got to teach them responsibility that, you know, if they do something, they got to suffer their own consequence. That's important, but that's not the number one thing. The number one thing is to get that kid to Jesus. Now, once again, this is the frustrating thing because you can't get saved for them, but you can, just like that mother takes that date and rubs it on the gums of her little baby to create a suckling motion, to create an appetite. It's the same for you. Let me just give you some practical advice. If you have kids, if you have grandkids, do everything, and I do mean everything in your power, to get them here every Sunday. Say, why? You're creating a hunger for God. These volunteers and leaders in our church love your children, okay? And your kid will not have a hunger for God if you don't have him in proximity so that he can have a relationship with God. It's like, and I've told you before, the the old country preacher that I grew up under, he said, the reason some of you don't get called to do anything is because you ain't within calling distance. And you want your kids to turn out right? Now, once again, there's no promise they're going to vote like you, wear their hair like you, uh, like the same things you like. Get that out of your mind. That's not really that important, okay? Um, You know, I mean, look. We all have things that we like that we don't like that our kids do or they, uh, they wear or whatever. Okay, I get that. But don't fight your battles in the wrong place. I'm not saying don't be the parent. I'm not saying don't be in charge. What I'm saying is you got to understand what's most important. And you know what's most important? To get your kids to God. That's it. Now, look, um, you've got a better chance of them loving the Lord if they're here than you do if they're not. So whatever it takes, do that. Get your kids in church. Uh, Let me say this. Our culture says that whatever the child feels should be affirmed. Actually, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, it's the opposite of what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying that you should be mean to your kids. What I am saying is, though, that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Of course. Why? Because they're just little—they're just little skulls full of mush. All right, they—they they don't know what they're doing. Okay. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction, the rod of discipline, will drive it far from him. And so, what is he saying? He's saying that. Uh, if I will discipline my child, if I will guard my child, if I will make sure that um, we've got this relationship with God as the priority, that I've got a better chance. So what is the rod of discipline? Well, it's an instrument of correction and discipline, not of abuse, okay? Some people think that if you use corporal punishment that you're abusing your child And I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that's scriptural. And I know from experience, I mean, oh my goodness, I got more spankings than probably the average human being ever received growing up, okay? And I turned out okay. And the point is this. I don't hate my parents. I don't think they were abusive. In fact, I absolutely am thankful that they love me enough to discipline me. And so uh, this idea of the rod, do you remember another place that the word rod is used in the Old Testament? 
Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, that rod was used for the enemy, okay? And that brought comfort. And the idea here is this. I believe that when you um, use correction, you bring comfort to this child. I mean, maybe not at the moment. Maybe they don't like it at the time. But one day they will. They'll be very thankful for it. Um, so it was also, a rod was also used as a guide and a prod. Sometimes with shepherds, they just had to keep the sheep in line a little bit. All right, all right big boy, get over there. All right, you, you, you're wandering off. Okay, Let, let's get back in line. Proverbs 29, 15, to discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. So, how can you discipline your kid God's way? Well, and I'm almost finished, okay? But you need to read this. You need to hear this. You need to remember this. Number one, be authoritative. Be authoritative. Your authority comes from God, okay? So, be authoritative. Number two, be clear. Don't be vague. When you tell your kid to do something, don't just, you know, spew it out there in the ether and hope they can figure it out. Be clear. Not, hey, you know, you need to be home by, you know, curfew time. Okay. No, that doesn't work. You better be home at 6.03 p.m. on today's date, okay? Because if you don't, you're in trouble, all right? You got to be clear. So be authoritative, be clear, be consistent. That's one of the hardest things to do. I tell you what, if you don't, if you do that again, I'm going to come, come on now, be consistent. If you make a threat, follow through, okay? Uh, don't, you know, don't make a promise without delivering. Be consistent, be bold. Um, you're the parent, act like it. I, I realize that in our culture today, they put an unbelievable emphasis on the the feelings of the child, okay? Let, 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 me, let me say this. Um, in the household that I grew up in, and I'm not saying that it was the perfect household, it wasn't, but I can honestly say I was never consulted about my feelings about anything. Really, I wasn't. You know why? They didn't care. No, did they want me to be happy? Of course. Did they want me to be miserable? That didn't really matter to them as long as I was doing what they were saying, okay? And so, all right, I get it. Y'all were like running the alarm clock saying I'm done, okay? So <laughs> maybe just put your phone on silent when you come in. That'd be great, all right? So uh, be bold, be transparent. You're not perfect, okay? Uh, be authentic, Deuteronomy 6. When you walk by the way, when you go to bed, when you get up, be authentic, Draw clear lines in the right places. By the way, you got to learn what battles to fight. Some battles are not worth fighting. I learned a long time ago that the length of hair was not that important. It really wasn't. It wasn't about whether or not they were going to have a relationship with God. It was about my preference. And you know what? I had to learn, don't fight battles that don't matter. I have a pastor friend, uh, he pastored a church in New Hampshire, and a guy that he knew and, and I was introduced to, uh, he came from a very, very strict background, and um, he had these rules for his daughter. His daughter went to the public school there, and his daughter, um, he didn't believe that a woman should wear pants, all right? So that was his rule, that his daughter could not wear jeans, even during the winter, okay, to this school, which was like in New Hampshire, it was very freezing, very cold. This girl was mercilessly made fun of and mocked, and it eventually got to the point where she ran away from home. She was 16 years old. And I'll never forget my friend telling me that this pastor friend of his came to him and said, I don't know what to do, Paul. Give me some advice. My daughter has run away from home. And he looked at this pastor and he asked this question. He said, I've got a question to ask you, sir. 
He said, what's that? He said, do you love your daughter or do you love dresses? Decide, because this is where the decision lies. Either you love your daughter or you love dresses so much that you're willing to lose her. And he said, oh, I never thought of it that way. And I think that illustrates how we are to learn to draw the line, okay? Draw it where it matters, not where it doesn't. And then start early and still respect and responsibility. And if you do, Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. Anybody would like a little peace of mind in this culture that we live in? Be great, wouldn't it? Well, God says there is hope. So good parenting begins with your relationship with God. And if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of Christ, that's where it starts. Turn to Him. Ask Him to be your Savior today, okay? I know when I'm wet, folks, okay? I love you. Have a great day. Hold on. We got to take the offering. I, I'm not going to let that. <laughs> Ushers come. Okay. Uh, so sometimes you got to know when you beat. All right. So um, you can put your offering, your next step card, whatever, in the offering at this time. Go ahead and start passing that, guys. I'm just killing time anyway. So don't pay attention to me. Nobody else does. So uh, <laughs> don't forget now, if you're a parent, you got kids at home, or your grandparent, um, you can go pick up one of these books. They're in the little room to the left when you go out. All right. So you can get that if you'd like one of those.